This conference will now be recorded. Whether this year is your first time joining the Ontario Invasive Plant Council for a webinar or you have joined our webinars in the past, welcome. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. All of the attendees have been placed on mute to eliminate any excess background noise. Today's presentation will be about 45 minutes and there will be some time at the end for questions. So if you have any, just write them in the chat box below and we will go through them at the end of the webinar. Also just a plug in for some of our future webinars. Um, we still have three after this one on March 20th, 27th and April 10th. So have a look at them and you can sign up on our website. So, uh, Today, Jill Crossway will be providing us with an update on some of the great restoration and invasive species removal work happening on Pelee Island. So welcome, Jill. Um, Jill Crossway is the Nature Conservancy of Canada's Conservation Biology Coordinator in Southwestern Ontario. Thank you so much for speaking today and providing us with an update. So I'll uh, switch over to you now. Thanks, Vicky. There we go. Okay, can everyone see my screen now? I can see it, yeah. Okay, you can be everyone. Um, Hopefully everyone can. <laughs> if anyone can't, please write in the chat box below. Okay, well, thanks, Vicki. Thanks for, for inviting me here today. I, I'm excited to talk to everyone about some of the work that we've been doing. I can talk on and on about Pelee Island, um, but I will try to keep it to 45 minutes. Um, so just to give you a, a little bit of a, an overview of what I'm going to cover um, today, I'm going to give a little bit of a, an introduction to what the Nature Conservancy of Canada is, if you're not familiar with uh, the organization. Um, talk a bit about our planning process um, from kind of a really broad scale to fine scale, um, a little bit of the background on Pelee Island, and then get into the weeds with our invasive species control, um, and then some of our restoration work. Um, so the invasive species, obviously that is the bad that we are getting out of, and uh, the restoration is returning some of the native species um, in some of these areas. Um, although that our restoration work does come with some of its own invasive problems as well. Um, so a bit of background on the Nature Conservancy of Canada, or NCC. So we are a nonprofit um, private land conservation organization. Um, there's often some confusion with the of Canada part that we're actually government. We're not. Um, we acquire and manage land for conservation, and we're actually the largest uh, land conservation charity in Canada. Um, we were founded in 1962, and so far I've secured over 2.8 million acres, or over a million hectares across Canada. Um, and we really try to plan our work carefully so that we can focus on the, on the areas um, with the highest diversity and perhaps the highest threats as well. Um, so a, kind of an example of, of where our pro projects are in Canada, uh, this map shows all these yellow dots are our NCC projects. Um, this is only up to, to 2015, so there's going to be a few more in there, but you can see that it kind of reflects where humans lie on the landscape as well, because those are, are tending to be the, the bits of the landscape that need the most protection. Um, we have what we call priority natural areas, and those are, are really areas where we've uh, we've identified as hotspots for biodiversity, where maybe there's a lot of rare plants, maybe there's a lot of threats to those bio, bits of biodiversity that we want to protect. Um, and we've kind of identified areas that we really think that we can um, have an impact on the landscape. Um, so maybe we can actually have a measurable improvement on our, our biodiversity or habitat um, targets that we might have. So I'm gonna be talking today about our um, natural area, the Western Lake Erie Islands, um, and specifically Pelee Island. So this is just a, a map showing our, our um, the, the natural area boundary in general. So we, the, the natural area we consider to be all of the Canadian islands in the Western Lake Erie Archipelago, uh, which is a series of islands reaching between Point Pelee and the Marblehead Peninsula. Um, Point Pelee obviously being in Ontario and uh, Marblehead Peninsula in Ohio. Um, and there's about 25 islands in total um, and nine of those are Canadian. Um, and those are the ones that we focus on. And Pelee Island specifically is the one I'm gonna be talking about today. You can see it here. Um, it's about, it's the largest one in the archipelago and it's about six kilometers wide by 10 to 15 long, depending on where you measure it from. 
And it was originally um, several rocky islands connected by marsh, um, and it was drained by some very enterprising individuals back in the late 1800s. So they dug a series of canals and installed pump houses to drain the marsh and turn all of that marshland into farmland, um, which opened up quite a lot of new land, obviously, and also um, the land is very rich because it was once marsh. Um, there's also a lot of cattle grazing up until the 1970s um, and the population has really fluctuated quite a lot. Um, now there's only a quite a small permanent population of about 150 people um, that swells quite a lot in the summertime with cottagers and tourists. Um, it's, it's kind of unique in that about 18% of it is in conservation ownership and that's actually about 60% of all of the natural habitat on the island. Um, compared to Essex County, which has about 7% uh, natural cover, Peely's got about 32% of, of the whole area, which is really fairly impressive for deep south Ontario. Um, another point I guess I should make about this is that it's actually, it's almost the southernmost point in Canada. Um, the, there's a little tiny island just south of it called Middle Island that is actually the southernmost point, um, but for all human purposes generally this is the southernmost point and it has fairly unique climate as well um, being that it's in the middle of the eye of of Lake Erie and surrounded by water um, which has kind of an ameliorating effect on on its climate and, and temperatures especially at the beginning and end of the seasons it's got quite a long growing season um, it's about on par latitude wise with northern California um, and Italy so you end up with good wine growing regions <clears throat> So most of the remaining landscape that's not natural is actually either soybeans or vineyards, generally speaking. Um, and the natural bits support tons and tons of rare species and habitats. So this is another, that, that previous image kind of makes it look really lush and green and natural. Um, but you can see on this map that a lot of the natural habitats clustered in what was actually the former islands on the, before it was drained. Um, so it's fairly concentrated and then there's a lot of agriculture in between. Um, so like a lot of Ontario, um, or at least in southern Ontario, habitat loss and invasive species are the biggest threats to, to the native diversity on the island right now. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about how NCC is working to address both of those threats, um, focusing on the invasive species, but a bit about the work that we're doing to reverse habitat loss on the island. Um, and also, um, I want you to take a look at, the, at this pitch or the, this map and, and think about um, just how disturbed the landscape is because a lot of the stuff that we're looking at with our invasive species is that everything is, is really prevalent throughout. Um, pretty much all of the natural habitat on the island has been disturbed, none of it's pristine, um, often it's been grazed over, um, but a lot of the native species, even the rare species, have persisted regardless. Um, but it does mean that our invasive species approach um, tends to be a little bit different than areas where you can still do some of that early detection rapid response. Um, we tend to be doing a lot of damage control with this stuff. Um, <clears throat> so plant diversity is pretty high. Um, there's about 640 plant species recorded on the island. Um, it may be a little bit higher than that. That was, I think, as of 2014. Um, and of those 642, 81 of them are considered rare by NHIC. Um, so that's the S1 to S3, and there's quite a lot of Kasiwik and Kasaro ranked species as well that are threatened or endangered or special concern. Um, as well as, uh, as rare species, 194 of those plant species, or about 30% of them, are non-native. Um, now, not, most of those are not problematic non-natives, but there are quite a few of those, and we do, it does mean that we have to prioritize a bit what we want to tackle and what's actually going to be an issue for us. Um, so we've looked at invasive species from kind of a landscape scale, so at the, the natural area level. Um, so NACP in this case is actually Natural Area Conservation Plan, so we've developed a plan for, for what we want to achieve in this natural area. And some of the threats that we've identified are plant threats. Um, the big ones being Phragmites, garlic mustard, invasive shrubs, Eurasian pasture grasses, and white mulberry. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about white mulberry here. It's kind of a specific thing um, because red mulberry is still present on the island. Um, it's an endangered species and there's a couple big ones left that are still reproductive, but they don't actually manage to produce many um, intact or, or genetically pure red mulberries because white mulberry swamps them out. It hybridizes with them and reproduces much, much faster. Um, so this is kind of a unique threat on Peely because there are still some uh, some native red mulberries left that we'd want to be protecting. 
Um, some other considerations that don't necessarily come up at the natural area level, it's more at the management, the property management level, um, is the relevance to some of our other work. So with a lot of our restoration, we're creating new habitats and, and doing specific activities that may open up new areas to invasive species. Um, so we may want to be prioritizing some of our work to make sure that we're not just creating a, a gap for an invasive to fill and, and targeting some of our removal work around other areas that we want to be doing work. <clears throat> so mapping out those threats on the island um, is basically just reveals that they're everywhere. Everything is everywhere. Um, and it's it really, these species map to where the habitat exists. Um, so Phragmites, for example, you can see is on all of the properties that we own. Um, and if you were to actually look at where each of those blue dots are, um, you'd find that was actually a wet spot. And it would be almost all of the wet spots on those properties have Phragmites in them. Um, so just to, to, to show you one of our, our management plan maps for our Florian Diamante Nature Reserve, um, this map shows our targets, which are ha the habitat-based targets, as well as our threats. Um, so forest is green, um, alvar is yellow, and um, wetlands are, um, are blue. And you'll also see that um, the way we've mapped out Phragmites, for example, it maps up almost exactly with the coastal wetlands. It's a little bit bigger because one of our restored fields also has a broken field tile and also has Phragmites in it. Um, so this map doesn't mean that we have 100% Phragmites in every single wetland that we've created, but we do know from experience that Phragmites is going to pop up in each of these wetlands and we need to check them almost every, every year or every other year and deal with anything that comes up in it. Um, so if it doesn't have Phrag now, it's going to have Phrag later. Um, and we can kind of start tackling that and making sure that it doesn't spread. <clears throat> So speaking of Phragmites, this has been one of the big ones that we've been tackling on Peely starting in about 2011. Um, we had one really large population that we dealt with in 2011 and most of our, our work now is just catching up, um, cleaning up the work that we've done already and catching new populations before they spread. Uh, we use quite a few strategies to deal with it. Um, some of them we adapted and then dropped because they didn't work out as well as we'd hoped. Um, and then some things that we just have to keep on on doing as we as we learn a little bit more about um, what works and what doesn't. Um, where possible, uh, we found it helps to hit the big patches. It will help remove the seed source. Um, and there's some areas as well. This this particularly big patch was adjacent to a um, ash swamp, and emerald ash borer hit Pelee Island really hard. A lot of the uh, wet areas were dominated by ash, and now that that's fallen out. The uh, canopy is is opened up, and now Phragmites can get into those swamps. <clears throat> so being able to get rid of this before it spreads in there was was a bit of a priority for us. Um, and the really important parts, as I'm sure a lot of you are already aware, is that following up and and checking on the the potential habitat is really important to make sure that it doesn't get to this point again. So looking at a map of Phragmites on the island, um, pink is, is wetland and red is um, spots that we knew where Phragmites was. So I think this was actually 2016. Um, some of these wetlands now have Phragmites in them. They didn't in 2016 because they were just created that year. Um, and you can see that there's a couple of really large populations in the naturally occurring marshes at the north and south end of the island. Um, and then it's the other thing to note as well is that it's scattered pretty um, evenly across the island, wherever the habitat is appropriate for it. Um, you can see that there, those blue lines going across the island, those, that is the uh, canal network that was dug to drain it. Um, so there's a lot of potentially suitable habitat here, and I suspect that this mapping is really not complete. So as I was saying, we take a few different approaches and we've used a few things, the, the kind of larger scale roll, burn and spray, hand wicking, spraying, spraying and cutting, cutting and drowning, which we haven't actually used on Peely yet, but there's a few spots where I think we're gonna have to start using it and be, be doing that uh, this coming year. So the roll, burning and spraying, this is something that we did in 2011. We hired Frank Letourneau to come out and, uh, and roll it flat and, and burn it and then spray it again in the fall. So this was again, it was a large patch on the beach. Uh, it was about 100 or 800 meters long um, and varying widths right along the beach 
and um, was actually blocking beach access for a lot of places. So you couldn't walk along because there was frag in the way. Um, and this was, it was a pretty big project and we need, required a, a litter of opinion, um, both for the herbicide use because it wasn't really forest. Um, so we couldn't do it under our forestry exterminators licenses. Um, and it's also in species at risk habitat. So we needed a letter from MNR for that as well. Uh, pretty much all of Peely's species at risk habitat. And this was an activity that could potentially impact it um, for obvious reasons. So we rolled it, burned it, let it grow up and then sprayed it. So the rolling bit, um, you can see I'm actually lying on top of the Argo there. Um, that was part of the MNR permitting because uh, it, this is an Eastern Fox snake habitat. Uh, and we ended up doing this at the end of April, I believe. Um, so the snakes have probably emerged at that point. So while we walked along the edges of the population, um, if you've ever tried to walk through a dense Phragmites patch and look for snakes, it's it's not very easy. Um, so what we actually did instead of walking through it is that we perched on top like that and looked for any snakes trying to slither away or and stopped if needed. Uh, we also, if I spotted any driftwood that was in there, then we'd stop and move the driftwood in case there was something hiding under it. Um, we set it on fire, we let it grow. Um, and then he sprayed it in the fall. And if we'd been able to do this as, as completely and thoroughly as we'd wanted, we would have burned it, rolled it and burned it again the following year. Um, he actually did try, got out to the island twice. The first time um, the track got damaged by a, a stump. And the second time the wind was blowing the wrong direction, so he wasn't able to burn. Um, so we didn't ever um, manage to get rid of that second round or that second round of biomass, um, but it still worked quite well. Um, within a couple of years, we had about 26 native species just in a casual walkthrough. Um, we had a special concern species, swamp rose mallow, popping up. Um, it's all looking really good. Um, but we do need to continue up with continue with follow up. So we spent about five years doing follow up treatment. Um, the first round was was a couple patches towards the forest that we weren't weren't able to get completely when he sprayed the first time around, and then we had it just kind of individual bits every year, um, either that were coming back um, that weren't completely killed or potentially that were getting um, depo dropped on the, uh, on the beach, just washed up because it is a little bit of a deposition zone there. Um, and then in 2017, the lake level came way up. And you can see in 2013, this tree right here with the red arrows pointing at is the same tree that's in the water here. Um, so the shoreline pretty much disappeared and the forest is starting to fall into the water. Uh, the lake is still really high and any little bits of frag that were left are now long gone. Um, I don't know what would have happened if we hadn't controlled that patch of Phragmites, but I have the feeling it probably would have been able to withstand that, that increased water level. And we wouldn't have been able to treat it because we wouldn't be able to use herbicide on it once it's in water. <clears throat> Um, a couple other techniques that we use for, for the smaller bits that are, are popping up on our fields and in our, our other wet areas. We tried hand wicking. Um, I know some people have had some success with this and we really didn't. Um, we initially thought that we were having good success, but what we find is that it doesn't quite get enough herbicide onto the stems. Your reach is not good enough to be able to, to get your hand all the way up to the top of the stem without breaking it. Um, and it just wasn't getting enough, enough uh, poison into the plant. Um, so we gave this a try and it, even though it's a really targeted approach with pretty much no by kill, um, it didn't really work that well. So we've kind of moved to spraying and we, we've tried hand sprayers as well, like just a little handheld spray for, for just a couple stems. Um, but the problem with that again is that the, the stalks are really tall and I don't know that you can necessarily see what, um, what she's standing in there, but that's actually a wall of poison ivy. So the frag is stand, sticking out of the poison ivy and the, the more reach you can get, um, the better. And the wand and the backpack sprayer was really good for that, um, as well as being able to get the uh, the quite tall stems. Um, so that's been kind of our, our uh, approach going forward, is that for anywhere where we can use herbicide, even if it's just a couple stems, we'll use a backpack sprayer. Um, we have done a little bit of cutting and spraying for a small patch, um, getting an a, a herbicide applicator with an operator's license on Peely is fairly challenging. Um, so getting someone with uh, a machine out there to do a small patch in these shrubs wasn't really um, a viable option for us. So we used a combi tool and we've been kind of hacking away at this smallish patch in the shrubs 
um, cutting it down, spraying the regrowth um, and pushing it back a little bit further each year. And we're making really good progress on this, um, but it is still fairly hard work and, and takes a fair bit of, of effort. Um, so just to summarize, uh, the big patches are generally a contractor job for us. Um, and if, if we can move, remove the dead material, that is great. We've had amazing results from removing the dead material with the burn. We had fantastic regrowth of native species on the beach. Um, the, the patch that we're treating, the medium-sized patch that we're cutting and spraying, um, we're not seeing nearly the regrowth of, of native species that we would, I think, if we removed the, the dead material. Um, but that's just kind of what it is, um, that we don't really have an opportunity to do that there. Um, and, and it's also a slightly different habitat. Uh, the small patches are treatable with backpack sprayer. Um, we're going to try cutting and drowning in a few spots. We created some wetlands this year um, that where there's there's some um, phragmites growing in the water and we weren't able to spray them. And the really important thing is monitoring. So as we create wet spots, um, it, we're creating phragmites habitat. So this picture right here is actually a, the edge of a created wetland um, about two years, two growing seasons later. And you can see there's already phragmites popping up in it. And we find that even if we don't actively dig a hole, um, a lot of the fields are, uh, <coughs> excuse me, are have are drained with clay tiles, um, and the clay tiles are quite old and are starting to break. So wet spots start appearing wherever the the tile is broken, and that's kind of a perfect opportunity for phragmites to move in. So moving away from Phragmites um, to talk about garlic mustard, um, which kind of like the Phragmites you can see with all the red dots here is pretty much on all of our properties um, and is probably even more widely dispersed than the red dots suggest. So what we have found in terms of mapping it um, to know where it is, is that if there's trees there, there's garlic mustard there. And that's kind of how it goes on Peely. It's a disturbed habitat and Garlic mustard seems to be, the, the seeds at least seem to be fairly evenly dispersed throughout. Um, and if there's disturbance, there's even more garlic mustard. So anywhere there used to be a farmyard or maybe there's a dump site, garlic mustard pops up there. So how we prioritize this when we know it's fairly evenly spread across all of our properties um, really depends. So it depends on, on the control method we're able to use, the time of year, the accessibility of the patch, how much staff time we have available, um, a whole bunch of factors like that. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a couple slides. Um, but first of all, I was just going to bring back to this slide here, um, where you can see where we've mapped garlic mustard as being anywhere where there's actually forest habitat. Um, and this is actually not quite accurate because there's some treed alvar habitat here that is mapped as alvar, um, but it's actually great for garlic mustard too, even if it's thin soil, garlic mustard loves that too. Um, so it's a little bit of an underestimate of how much garlic mustard we might potentially have. And then if we're, if we're trying to target exactly where we should be aiming to get the biggest bang for a buck or where we're gonna find the biggest uh, garlic mustard populations, um, this map here is showing various anthropogenic features and a lot of dump sites, a lot of old buildings, um, a lot of abandoned cars, a lot of stuff like that on, on the, uh, the property. And if we target those areas, I know we'll find garlic mustard and that tends to be what we do, um, especially early in the year. Maybe it's a little bit too late to get into the really nicer bits of habitat uh, because there's native species are coming up, but in a lot of these areas, it, it can be quite um, crappy. And this can be a good spot to target to get rid of the bigger seed sources um, throughout in the more pristine, I say pristine in quote marks, um, areas. The garlic mustard is usually fairly uh, sparse, so where you might see it one year, it might be gone the next, depending on, on where turkeys are scratching, it's going to pop up or, or something similar like that. Um, so we try to do walkthroughs of those sparse areas to get maybe those little individual bits coming up, but targeting the bigger populations to remove the seed source is also a high priority for us. Um, so when it comes to which method we use to control, we do both pulling and spraying, depending on mostly on the timing and how sensitive the area is. Uh, the top photo is obviously not a high sensitivity area. It is a garbage dump. Um, and the circles in both of these photos show garlic mustard. 
neither of these are really big patches, but this is the sort of thing um, where we'd use just NCC staff instead of a big volunteer group. Uh, the top picture, probably we would spray that even as late as May because there's nothing sensitive around it. But the bottom picture is a really diverse wildflower area. Um, it's really cool glacial grooves buried deep into a property. It's still got garlic mustard, but we can target that with individual staff members pulling that out. Um, it's also an area where we wouldn't want to bring a ton of volunteers uh, because there'd be a lot of trampling if we brought in people um, who were not very experienced. So the spring, um, like I said, is great for early in the year before the native species are, um, emerge and in disturbed areas where we don't care so much. Uh, so like in this picture, you can see there's a lot of grasses. Um, there's a dumped vehicle, I think, in the corner. Um, and it's also fairly early on. It's great because it minimizes soil disturbance. You're not gonna cause more germination. Um, but we find it's really, really hard to get a good weather window on Peely because everything emerges really early. Uh, the ferry only starts running in April. Um, so we, it's kind of hit and miss whether or not we're actually able to do this. We can definitely cover a lot more ground if we're able to spray versus pulling, but it's not something we can do every single year. Uh, we do do quite a bit of pulling. Like I said, we do some targeted stuff uh, on the really sensitive spots, um, but it's also a great volunteer activity. Um, and there's one spot, let me just see, yeah. So we have one spot right next to a trail. So you can probably see a trail coming in here. And this, this whole section was pretty much monocultural garlic mustard. Um, it was really, really dense. And we've been working away at this area for since about 2010, 2011. Um, so we've been running events here with a big group of high school kids every year. And we're having quite a good effect. So. So far, it's only about one hectare. It's definitely a ton of manpower to make this happen, but it's really been quite effective and we're able to expand the area that we treat every year. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to mention is how we dispose of it. A lot of um, recommendations are that you take it off site and you garbage it, you stick it in garbage bags and, and take it to a landfill. Um, so maybe this is controversial, but we just leave it in a pile on the site. Um, you can see in this picture, you can see the, the stems a bit, but most of the material disappears by the next year. Um, and every year we're coming back to the same spot so we can check it. And if we do have anything germinating, you can see a few individuals here. Um, so if some seed does survive, then you can pull that the next year. And we really haven't noticed anything spreading from those sites, um, which has been great. I'm glad we don't have to haul it out of the, the site. It saves us a lot of plastic and it saves us a lot of effort. Um, and so far it's worked really well. Uh, just a, as a quick example here, this is that same site we were talking about. Um, the red arrow points to the same tree. In 2012, um, there was chest height garlic mustard, um, very dense. It was, it was a fairly big mess and we'd been pulling this, this same spot maybe for two years. Um, and this was obviously quite a bit of a warmer year. You can see there's a lot more leaves in the tree than there is in the 2018 photo, but there's actually no garlic mustard at all there in, in 2018. So after about six years of pulling, there's, there's nothing at all um, coming up. Although, and, and I just wanted to point out as well, this spot right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but just in the lower right hand corner of both of those pictures is approximately where we dump our giant pile of garlic mustard. Um, so even though we've been dumping it there every year, we're still not having any uh, germination or, or a lot of seed and um, spreading from that spot, which really makes me confident that leaving it on site is totally okay, at least in this situation. So uh, moving on to invasive shrubs, the next couple things I'm not going to talk about in nearly as much detail because it just it can go on and on. Um, but again, this is something you can see the orange dots. It's pretty much in all of our properties in any of the suitable habitat. Um, the, the thing that is most prevalent on Peely Island, the thing that we notice the most is Amur honeysuckle, which is I think somewhat unusual. I don't know it very much from anywhere else. Um, other, other than here, I know Tatarian honeysuckle gets talked about a lot, but I actually don't know that I've ever seen a Tatarian honeysuckle on Peely. Um, we also get buckthorn, autumn olive, multiflora rose, and dog rose, which is another one that I don't see being problematic outside of Peely so much, um, but it's kind of like multiflora rose. It grows in big sprawling patches, um, like this lovely individual here, which I think is multiflora. Um, it's also a Eurasian species. 
this picture here, you can see the uh, the amber honeysuckle. So it forms fairly dense patches on on some of our tree alvar. Uh, this is November, December. It holds its leaves quite late, and it leaves out quite early in the spring as well. Um, so as I was saying, it, some of these bits where the soil is quite shallow, and it's it's um, there are a lot of rare species as well. Uh, they has, have become dominated by these non-native honeysuckles, mainly amber honeysuckle. And we, we do our best to remove this and we do target some of these denser areas to open up the canopy a bit because there are a lot of rare snake species on Pili and one of the threats is succession. Um, and these honeysuckles that leaf out early on and create shade early on and, and quite late into the year um, could potentially be fairly detrimental to these species. So blue racer, for instance, is one of the rare species that's endangered and it only exists in Canada on Pili Island. Um, so we really want to be making sure that we can target the areas where we know it might be found, as well as areas that might be hibernacula. Um, so there's a lot of rocky areas around here and, and gaps into the, the ground that could be used as hibernacula, even if we, we don't know for sure. But we want to make sure that we're taking these the, the shrubs away from those areas in particular so that snakes that are emerging have better basking opportunities. <clears throat> Um, so that's what I mean by, by targeting priority habitats here, um, is that even though it is fairly prevalent everywhere, we want to hit the areas where the, the rare species and rare habitats are to make most difference. Um, and removing the really large seed producing individuals is really important too. Um, so we do this mostly via cut stump application of Garlon RTU. You can use that as a basal bark treatment as well. Um, but we've found that unless you get it completely around the whole stump, it often doesn't do a complete kill. Um, so the following year, we found um, a lot of stems that were half alive. So we've kind of moved to just cutting them and spraying the whole thing so that we don't have to deal with three sprouts. Um, I'm going to talk really briefly about Eurasian pasture grasses, which are mostly on the bits of the alvars that were grazed as a uh, used for pasture um, up until the 70s. Um, so again, this is kind of a relic of the grazing history. It's on the alvar bits that have really shallow soil. So I should probably clarify what, what alvar is. It's um, shallow soil over limestone. So it's less than 10 or 15 centimeters deep. And in some cases, it's just bare rock. Um, and Peely's got quite a bit of this habitat. But these non-native grasses and stuff like um, like orchard grass and Kentucky bluegrass form quite dense mats and allow soil to build up. And we think it's actually facilitating succession. So you can see this one photo um, of one of my colleagues has actually just rolled up the grass. It peels right off um, and it's created this dense mat sitting on top of the limestone. And um, we think that that is, uh, you know, as, as time goes on and the, the grass decomposes, it builds up an organic layer. You get a little bit of soil and things like shrubs that would normally need a much deeper um, soil layer can then establish. Um, and this bit that I'm holding here, I've just pulled that off, off some bare rock as well. It's got a sumac growing out of it. Um, so we've, we've done a little bit of removal of grass just by pulling the, the grass off the rock. And we find that all of our plants come back pretty quick. Um, a lot of the stuff that can survive on the harsh conditions of rocky soil that's half flooded, half parched, um, are, are really quite unique. Like this little guy here is Leucospora multifida. Um, it's called narrow leaf pale seed, I think it's a, is its official name, or Obi Wan Kenobia is its non official name. Um, and it's actually in water in, in this picture because it, it was an early spring photo and, and everything is flooded, but it does dry out as well and it does quite well in these conditions. So what we found is if we peel off the invasive grasses, plants like this one and other neat stuff like small skull cap just pop up on the uh, on the exposed rock. Um, <clears throat> we're kind of in a at an impasse as to where to go from here. I think we mostly just try to keep these bare bits bare. Um, maybe there's some opportunity for a burn to try to remove some of it. Um, it kind of depends. We're we're not quite sure what we're going to do everywhere yet. So to get into some of the restoration stuff, um, we've done when we first acquired our properties on Peely, uh, we had about 230 acres of agricultural land. So far, we've restored about 150 acres. We've got just a little bit left to go. 
Um, we have fairly broad goals when it comes to restoration and what we actually want to see. We just initially at least want natural habitat dominated by native species, wildlife habitat, um, and what it turns into from there is is kind of up to it, I guess. Uh, we do plant some oaks and things like that when we want to encourage forest, but we're in no rush to get to a forest habitat. Uh, we really just want to have something that, for pollinators and, and something to, to uh, facilitate dispersal between natural areas, uh, especially for things like snakes that, that may be somewhat limited by, by farm fields and, and that, that limits their dispersal. Uh, the wetland creation we do is also pretty straightforward. Um, most of Pili, like I was saying, was marshland, so it really wants to go back to being marshland. Um, it takes to it really well. So we pretty much mark out spots in a field where that seem to be low-lying and, and wanting to hold water, um, hire a contractor to come in and excavate those spots, as well as break and plug field tiles. Um, so if you're not familiar with, with um, tiling to drain fields, it's basically a grid of, of tubes planted under the ground to uh, extract the water more quickly. Um, and on Peely, a lot, of, or at least on our fields anyway, there's still a lot of old clay tiles. As I was saying earlier, uh, the modern stuff is usually that corrugated plastic black stuff, um, but these old clay tiles are still in place and they're kind of breaking up and they're, they break quite nicely when you go to, to make a wetland. So the contractor smashes those and plugs them up with clay. Um, the soil is really, really heavy clay. Um, and then we just wait for it to fill with, with rainwater. Uh, we try to make it as irregular as possible so that it doesn't, say, or so that it does look natural. Um, and slope gently to um, create kind of a wide littoral zone as well. Uh, the upland restoration that we do, uh, we're hand collecting all of the seed from the island. Um, there may be some interesting genetic stuff going on with Peely, we're not really sure, um, but we don't want to mess it up by bringing off island seed. Um, we usually get about 30 to 40 species. Uh, Vicki may recognize some of the pictures here because she's volunteered with us for some of this work. Um, and we focus mostly on early successional stuff, stuff that'll fill in and do well in this new habitat that we're creating, as well as some trees and shrubs that will will eventually fill in and get bigger. Uh, we do this, a lot of our planting's done by hand, either walking back and forth and hand scattering, broadcasting from an ATV, that kind of stuff. Um, we don't really have fancy equipment, so it's a lot of it is also volunteer based as well. Uh, we get volunteers to plant acorns and seedlings and, and really just try to get the seed on the ground. Uh, and we have had really spectacular results. Um, it, everything has looked really good. We get good diversity. Uh, the trees do well, the flowers do well, um, the water does well. Uh, we get some cool uh, snakes and, and wildlife using this, um, lots of pollinators. Uh, it's really been quite successful. Um, and what we find when we monitor it, so we do some fairly basic monitoring of just walkthroughs and creating a species list as we go. And we find that, generally speaking, the species that we plant dominate in abundance, um, but there's more diversity of non-planted species. Um, fortunately, most of those are native, um, but 7% of the species that we found are problematic invasive. So this is just from one field that varies a little bit, but I, it, I think if I were to count it up, we would have the same problematic invasives in every single one of the fields. Um, so even though we have, created all this cool habitat, we are also creating a void, which is how we end up with those um, unpleasant invasives that we maybe didn't think of to start. Um, the, these fields were part or, or cropped in soybeans up until the point where we plant them, um, so, which means they keep getting planted with soybeans and then occasionally winter wheat and they get sprayed with Roundup and they're kept really nice and clean. So when you stop planting soybeans, you get a really nice, basically an open garden um, ready for anything to move in. Um, and the things that are invasive tend to have the kind of characteristics, I'm sure as many of you know, um, that love disturbance, that uh, reproduce really well um, and are, are really poised to, to spread into these areas. So we've ended up with a few problems that were not problems before we started restoration. Uh, the picture on the left here um, is actually from Norfolk County. It's not from here. Uh, but all of these lovely silvery shrubs are all invasive autumn olive. And that pops up in our fields really, really readily down there. It's not a species we worry about on Peely. We have other invasive shrubs that we get there. 
Um, but it's just an example of how quickly something that's non-native and has the, the invasive characteristics can hop into these, these habitats. Um, over here is a big patch of white sweet clover. That's another one that's become a problem for us in some areas. And this picture is actually not non-native. This is a little cluster of hawthorns. Um, but we see the same thing with white mulberry, where a bird has found a nice tall thing to sit on and has um, created some fertilizer. And we get a nice little patch of, uh, of invasive shrubs. Um, so th this creates a little bit of an extra challenge, a little bit of extra work for us to go in and make sure we remove these guys until at least until all of our native stuff gets established. Um, so one of the ones that we found to be more problematic is actually Canada thistle. This is a noxious weed, and if we let it get out of hand, our neighbors complain. Um, so we don't like it either. We, we do want to get rid of it, but it, it, it's kind of a little bit of extra pressure if, if we have neighbors that are, are unhappy about it. Um, it grows in ditches and is problematic in restored fields adjacent to roadsides. So this is something that we didn't even realize really for our first restoration project. So this map is just showing some of the areas that we have restored, all the little green bits, our little green fields. Um, and the first ones that we worked on were little isolated patches like these guys that are not actually adjacent to roads. And we never had an issue with Canada thistle in them. Um, until we got to this nice big field here, and this ditch along this roadside is actually full of Canada thistle. Um, so we're going to have an ongoing problem with this uh, because we've restored this field in, in patches. So we have um, some fairly new fresh dirt every year for the past four years that we've had to keep going back and, and treating it. And I'm sure we're going to have to keep fighting with that for, for some time until the field matures a bit. <clears throat> And the other, uh, well, another interesting species that has popped up in our fields um, is bog bulrush. And this is something that Mike Oldham found in one of our created wetlands in 2018. So last summer in this nice um, pond that we made down here, uh, you can see there's a, a road along either side here. And this whole thing used to be an agricultural field. And all of these blue bits are wetlands that we've uh, installed in this field. And we assume probably ducks brought this species in. Um, it's Eurasian. It's a problem in rice fields in, in Western North America and California. And I think this is the first record for Ontario. Um, so lucky us, we get to uh, try to figure out how to get rid of it. Um, we're going to try and pull it this year. We may have to spray it. Um, but it's just another example of, of why we need to keep going back into these places and, and trying to make sure that we are tackling things that may become problematic as they pop up instead of waiting for them to, uh, to become more of a problem. So what next with a restoration? We only have one large field left on Peely. Um, it's about 86 acres, 84 acres. Um, and we actually got Ducks Unlimited to um, develop a plan for a large wetland complex. So this field was all marshland uh, before, before the, the uh, island was drained. Um, if you overlay this, uh, this map on an old map of the island, this line here, this contour line, pretty much lines up with the shoreline of the marsh. So we plan to put that all back. Um, it's going to look something like this. Uh, it's not terribly exciting looking at it like that, but basically we'll put up, um, break all of the tiles and install some dikes along around the edges and turn this whole area into wetland with a few deeper pockets excavated um, and have some great opportunities for trail expansion and bird watching in here and hopefully lots of shorebird habitat as well. Uh, we have a water control structure that hopefully we'll be able to draw down um, slowly in, this, in the springtime um, to create mud flats and hopefully get lots of shorebirds. Uh, we have a couple other things that we're going to do here specifically with researcher recommendations for species at risk, um, including ponds for salamander breeding and maintaining some open areas for, uh, for blue racers. Um, so this is something that we're really excited we're in the process of fundraising for and if everything goes well we'll be breaking ground in 2019. So that is pretty much it for uh, for me. I just want to say a quick thank you to the community of Peely Island and everybody who has funded our work um, to really help us do all of this work without without our funders and without our community support. Uh, we really wouldn't have been able to 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 do all of this work. Um, so we're really grateful to everybody for for helping us achieve these these results. 
Um, so I guess we have some time for questions. Um, I just wanted to point out if you have anything you wanted to email me, I've got my email up there. And if you are really excited about wetlands and want to support the project, there's a link up there as well. So thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Joe. That was awesome. <clears throat> really interesting. And uh, yeah, and it was a great uh, thing to volunteer with and get experience. And um, are you still out look, looking for volunteers if anyone listening might be interested or know anyone? Yeah, absolutely. We're actually going to have a couple of volunteer events uh, this year. Um, there'll be a seed collecting event in the fall and acorn planting later on as well. Cool. And yeah, if anyone has questions, just write them in the chat box below. Um, I have one about the disposal. Um, so when when the volunteers were pulling out the garlic mustard, it was usually before the seeds, just when it's gone to flower. So um, yeah. would that be part of it, like the strategy, just to make sure the seeds don't spread? and. Yeah, we usually aim to get it. The, it. It can be tricky. It depends on what the weather's been like. If it's been a really warm spring, um, there might it might just be starting to set seed, but it's still mostly flowering. Um, so we don't tend to have a lot of issues with seeds. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it definitely saves us a lot of time when it. When yeah, it that would be a lot of effort. Uh, effort to haul out all those garbage bags out on Healy Island. Are you finding that the whole stump treatment on the um, honeysuckles are working? Like yeah. The yeah, it's it's been really effective. Um, as long as we cut it down and we spray the top, it seems to reach all of the areas. It's more when we try to get around the the edges that it wasn't so good. Um, although the area you may remember doing that work uh, on on our Gibwood property, and uh, we found that it, I guess there was really good germination of of the seed last year because it was just a carpet of seedlings. The whole thing. It didn't matter whether we treated the area or not. Um, so we're definitely going to be coming back there. Oh, good. And a question here, how are you disposing of the emmer honeysuckle? We usually just cut it and pile it or leave it where it falls. Um, so a lot of the time we're, when we, we're treating it, it has actually set seed already. Um, we don't try to save the seeds and, and bag them up, um, mainly because one more year is probably not going to make a big difference. Um, the seed's going to last for a bit and and it's been setting seed for years um, and the amount of trouble and, and extra time we'd spend trying to, to reserve those seeds isn't worth it. We haven't found that these stems re-sprout so we can pile them on the ground and they don't seem to re-root, um, at least not with this species. So that's one good thing for us anyway. Oh, that's good. Hmm. Any more questions? We'll just wait another minute or two. Sure. Oh, another question. Uh, have we tried not spraying the ammer honeysuckle and just pulling it, removing the whole root system? Um, we've done that a little bit with small ones. So when they're really small, they can be pulled. The big ones, um, the soil is very rocky. So actually pulling them out and uh, and getting rid of the whole root system would be very difficult. The the amount of effort that would go into doing that would definitely be a lot more than, than it is to cut and spray. Um, so we, we have really focused on the cutting and spraying. All right. Oh, there's a couple more questions coming in. Thanks for a great presentation. To what extent is seed availability a limiting factor in restoration sites knowing that off-island seed is not being used? Uh, right, that's a, a great question. Um, it is somewhat limiting. So we've found that 20 acres is really about as big as we want to do in a given year um, with on-island seed. We do use a, a lower seeding rate than we might in uh, on the mainland. Our seeding rate is, I had it in the presentation and I took it out, I think it's about 
one or two kilos per hectare. Um, and it seems to work fairly well. We get good establishment, um, but we would probably get less invasives if we had a higher seeding rate. Um, most of our fields were fairly small. We're under that um, 20 acre limit. Um, so we were able to just do them all in one year. But the one large field that we did that was 86 acres, we actually divided it into four sections and did it in, over the course of four years so that we could get all of our seed from the island. And are you able to treat the Phragmites in small patches without an operator's license and only an exterminator license? Yeah, so we, since it's all on our own properties, we don't need operator's licenses for, for NCC staff to do that. Um, if we wanted to hire someone, regardless of where it was, um, we would have to, to have someone with an operator's license. Um, when it comes to uh, using our exterminator's licenses, uh, I, I guess we, we all have um, forestry applicators, um, and we've got a couple others with aquatics and, and landscape licenses as well. Um, and most of the areas that we're treating could be considered forestry improvement. Um, a lot of these restored areas will eventually be forest. It's, it's part of our management to get it to that forest point, I guess. Um, so that, that's why we're able to use just the exterminator license and not have to get an operator's license. Mm, if we wanted to good. go off our properties, we would have to, to have that. Mm. All right, awesome. Um, there's maybe one more question we've got time for, I think. All right. Yeah, I think we'll we'll wrap up. Um, so thanks so much, Jill. It was a really great presentation. And uh, yeah, and if you need to contact Jill, you can. Um, her email is up here. Right. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, and thanks everyone for listening in. Thanks so much, Jill.